Welcome to this series of the Giants of Cardiac Surgery. My name's Joel Dunning and we're here at Amex in Moscow and I'm absolutely delighted to be with a personal hero of mine, uh, uh -huh. Professor Jim Cox. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Um, uh, I, I was very interested to hear in your history that you, you were almost going to be a professional boss, a baseball player and then uh, it was between that and going to, to, to medical college uh, and you got the same offers uh, on the same day but luckily for us uh, you did go to medical college. Um, uh, you went and you worked for 10 years with David Sabiston at Duke. Uh, that's where you did your, your residency before you went to Washington uh, University School of Medicine. And, uh, and it's there that in 1987 you really changed the face of cardiac surgery, performing the first operation for a surgical cure for atrial fibrillation. And, um, and it's that that I'd absolutely love to talk to you about. I was really interesting to read about this, this person that pushed you into it. It was a patient, uh, George mm -hmm. Deere. So, yeah. so tell oh, us, yeah. how, how did it come about that you did the first operation for atrial fibrillation? Well, I have to say you know your history well, I'm trying, if you know George Deere's name. Uh, <laughs> Yes, we were. We had been working on. Uh, first of all, I've often said that the maze procedures didn't really come out of thin air. You know, we'd been working on uh, treating other arrhythmias for many years, and decided uh, eventually, after the electrophysiologist uh, developed catheter techniques for all those other types of procedures, we focused on eight, uh, treating atrial fibrillation and. Uh, worked on it for about seven or eight years before we figured uh, out exactly how to do it. We were in the process of uh, studying it when out of the blue I got a call from uh, an airline pilot from uh, Cyprus, He's the Greek side of Cyprus, and that was George Deere. And he had read some obscure uh, comments or something, or a little article or something I'd written a few years before about atrial fibrillation and he said he wanted to get on the plane because he could fly anywhere being pilot. He said, I want to get on a plane, come over and have you treat me. He said, I, I'm in line to be the chief uh, pilot for Cyprus Airways, which is really an elite uh, airways, a beautiful airline. Uh, but he said I was diagnosed as having uh, atrial fibrillation, so I've been grounded. And uh, he was 37 years old. <clears throat> and I said, well, I told him on the phone, I said, we really don't have any, any way of treating it yet. We're just working in the lab, you know, and we're not, we're not there yet. He said, well, I'm coming anyhow. So he came and uh, he spent five days with us at uh, Barnes Hospital in St. Louis. And uh, he saw all the electrophysiologists. He went over to the laboratory, saw what we were doing and so on and so forth and uh, insisted that he have an operation and we said no, we got everybody together. We said, I said, we're not ready to do this. And so he very reluctantly uh, got on the plane and went back home without an operation. And uh, this was the year and a half before we did the first maze procedure. And so he stayed there for about five months, uh, six months, and then called again. He called every week, every week he called. Are you made any, have you made any progress? And I said, no, we've not made much progress. Finally, after about six months, he came back and uh, insisted. He said, I'm not leaving until you do something. Well, we, we had developed an operation at that time that was not the maze procedure on the basis of what we had learned about uh, atrial fibrillation. And we thought that it had a good chance of working. It worked every time in the lab. And he found out about that. And he said, well, tell me about this atrial transection procedure. And I said, George, you have to stop going to the lab, you know, and so on. So we went over all, this, all the things and so on. And so finally, after uh, a long time, we finally reluctantly agreed to do it. And we did it in September of 86. And uh, he did really well for about five months, no AFib at all, and then developed a uh, a pericarditis or maybe a little myocarditis and went back into atrial fib and so we weren't terribly surprised because we weren't there but we by that time had figured out the maze procedure and uh, shortly the, well I guess uh, just eight or ten months later uh, did the first maze procedure and of course G George was right on top of all this and we did it on a, a, a 
cardiologist from just across the river in St. Louis. And, uh, and it worked very well. And George knew everything about it, knew the patient's name, called him, called that patient every week. Uh, and I told George, I said, we're, not, we're gonna wait six full months before we even think about doing another one. And so that's what we did. And so George ended up being actually the second maze, but he was the first patient to have something done, which didn't work. So. Yeah, I mean, fantastic. And then, and then the maze procedure you developed, the cut and sew maze, was phenomenally successful. I mean, tell us about the, the success rates you were getting. Well, uh, you know, when you do the first one and you start following them, you don't have a long follow-up or a large number of patients. And uh, so, obviously, the, we were doing one case every six months. So in the first three years or so, we did seven cases. And after we'd done seven cases and followed them for six months, a minimum of six months, and all of them were cured or age were fit, no medicines or anything. And so I, I called uh, Dr. John Kirkland. No, I didn't call him. I sent him four papers on it. And he called me and he said, I want to get together at the ATS meeting for dinner. And I want to go over these. I want you to explain to me exactly what you're doing here. He said, I think this is potentially important. And uh, oh, well, yeah, and so uh, we did that, and I sat in uh, his hotel room for about four or five hours after dinner one night. I don't even remember what city it was in, and uh, went over everything we'd done. Went over everything. He said, "Okay, what I want you to do, I want you to call all these people back in, and I want you to do these tests on them. This whole battery of tests, exercise tests, everything, which we did." He said, once you do that, he said, then uh, we'll reconsider these papers. He said, I think these are potentially the most important four papers I've published during my tenure as the journal editor, but he said, I want to be absolutely sure that we're not being led down a primrose lane. And so we brought all the patients back in, put them through all the tests. They did fine with them and so on. We had a little chart we put together, sent it back to Dr. Kirkland. And uh, so he said, fine, go ahead and send the papers. You know, we'll, we'll start reviewing the papers. There were four papers that were back-to-back -back papers that came, it was, it came as a unit, and he sent them to 11 reviewers. So one summer, I don't remember which summer it was, but I spent the entire summer answering 44 reviews. And uh, I finally, uh, I think we could finally convince 43 of the reviews that they were, <laughs> we convinced 10 of the reviewers they were okay, and the 11th one, we never convinced. And so I just told him, I said, I don't have anything else to say. I said, you know, I, I've never convinced this guy. And I think I probably worked with him later. You never know who it is, but I think I figured out who it was. <laughs> wow, that's terrible. Normally you get three reviewers, yeah, but to right. have to go through 11. So, so really the basis of the Cox Maze procedure is an extremely rigorous scientific approach. So you took a very scientific view on how to make the lesion sets and you very rigorously tested it. And then, and it really is sort of a very successful procedure. So how did it evolve from there to where we are now? Well, first of all, let me say something about that. Um, I, I've often said that, uh, one, this didn't come out of thin air, and two, I didn't do it by myself. I was uh, fortunate enough to spend the majority of my professional career from medical school on, uh, at one time or another, with uh, John Boyneau, who was an absolute genius electrophysiologist, and Rick Schuster, who his, his, uh, uh, spent even more time with Rick. And the two of them are the ones that really worked out all of the mechanisms for atrial fib. And when I finally saw what it was, I said, yeah, I, I can figure out some way to fix that. And so... Because you were doing quite detailed digital mapping. Yeah, we had that an animal yeah. model mm -hmm. that you'd induced AF from mm -hmm. causing mitral regurgitation. One of the reasons I left Duke and went to St. Louis is they had the only digital uh, mapping system in the world at the time. They built it. Uh, uh, two people named one Frank Witkowski who had worked for NASA as a scientist and after the moon shots went into uh, cardiology and became a, a, a fantastic, uh, uh, he was a fantastic engineer working in heart disease now, and Peter Kaur. Uh, so they built this system uh, in St. Louis and uh, that's what we used to map patients and John Bueno and Rick Schuster developed the uh, animal systems and uh, Wachowski and Core developed the, the 
human systems and we were seeing exactly the same thing both. And was this, this was a percutaneous multi-lead sort of mapping, was it? Was this like... No, it was, uh, no, it was on, it was a direct uh, application of a... Like, no, no, it was, it, we uh, directly applied up to 256 electrodes right on the surface of the atrium in both animals and in patients. And we were doing still a lot of patients with the WPW syndrome, doing surgery on those, and about 30% of those people had atrial fibrillation. So we went through the investigation review board at Barnes and got permission to put these little plaques on uh, the WPW patients who had atrial fib. We put these plaques of 256 electrodes and map about three or four seconds of data during atrial fibrillation and then take them off and uh, spend the next month trying to figure out what they meant. So taking that map and deciding how to do every lesion line, how did that evolve? Well, what we, we had always been able to map uh, specific arrhythmias to specific sites in the heart. In other words, the WPW, AV load reentry, ventricular tachycardia, all of those things had focal points in the heart that were critical to the arrhythmia. And so we assumed that we could, be, we could do the same thing with atrial fibrillation. And we quickly learned that we couldn't do that, that it's just completely, I don't want to say chaotic, but it has, it's pretty chaotic. And it changes, you know, five times a second. So you, what you see right now is not what you see tomorrow. And that's one of the problems that we still face, actually, at both uh, electrophysiology, interventional electrophysiology, and, and cardiac arrhythmia surgery, is that we are still, 30 years later, still trying to map guide the interventional treatment of atrial fibrillation and you can't do it. So if you think about where we are right now, there are two operations that are, have been proven to be uh, effective for atrial fibrillation. For paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, that's pulmonary vein isolation. That does not require mapping. You know, you can just go in and do a pulmonary vein isolation with or without mapping, you, you have elect, electrical maps there to document, to test, to document that you're completely isolated. But where you put your lesions is not based on an electrophysiologic map. They're there to, to create pulmonary vein isolation. So that's an anatomically based procedure. The other is a maze procedure for any kind of AFib, including uh, long-standing persistent. And once we realized that, uh, that uh, we couldn't map atrial fib, the fallback position was, well, let's put lesions in the heart where no matter what the atrial fib looks like, it can't fibrillate because it's based on macro re circuits. And we knew that one way to do that would be to just bread loaf the heart, and that obviously is not going to be effective. So the trick was to be, to be able to ablate the arrhythmia by putting lines close enough together that the re circuits didn't have enough area to form in. And once you've ablated it, to leave the heart so it would respond to a normal sinus rhythm so that all the whole atrium would activate. And it, 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 it occurred to me uh, almost uh, like an epiphany that well, we could put this thing in the form of a maze and that would stop the arrhythmias but it would allow the heart to beat afterwards. And so. The, for, the, the pattern of the maze procedure was primarily uh, because of what we wanted to have after it ablated the arrhythmia. It's not the only way to ablate it. It's the only way to ablate it and leave the heart so it'll activate the whole atrium. The sinoatrial node pace through to the AV node. Right, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, so just for people out there, you know, what do you say to a surgeon that's doing a mitral repair in somebody that's got paroxysmal AF who's saying, oh, it takes too long, you know, I don't want to do this, it's going to complicate the operation. I mean, just maybe give a little summary of the absolute benefits to patients and really why everybody should have this well, procedure. Uh, all, the, all the surgeon has to do is look at the STS guidelines and the AATS guidelines because they were both published, or guideline recommendations were published in 2017 and they both are in agreement that uh, it is absolutely uh, recommended class 1a that patients like you just just described uh, should have uh, atrial fibrillation ablation uh, so from a purely legal standpoint a moral standpoint it's 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 if you don't do that 
then you're not giving patients the proper standard of care. Uh, from a physiologic and, and clinical standpoint, it's been shown over and over and over that there's several benefits to doing it. One, uh, in, in terms of what the AA, AATS recommendations say, you actually decrease the operative mortality by adding the AF ablation, which is not too surprising. You have two problems, and if you leave one of them behind, the patient's at more risk. Uh, John Kirkland again taught, taught us that years ago. So, uh, so w one of the things is that you decrease the uh, operative mortality by treating the atrial fib simultaneous, simultaneously. Uh, perhaps the greatest benefit is that, that's been shown for, with absolute certainty is that you decrease the incidence of long-term stroke, short-term and long-term stroke, by treating the atrial fibrillation. Part of that, and maybe most of it, is due to closing the left atrial appendage as a part of the procedure. Another, uh, you know, you have to improve quality of life, all those sorts of things, maybe some improvement in tricuspid regurgitation and so on. What the guidelines didn't address was the uh, uh, long-term survival rate. Since those guidelines came out, there have been two critical papers published, uh, and, and one in, uh, in 2018 by Ralph Damiano and another in 2019 by the group in uh, Northeastern uh, University group of seven institutions. And uh, they're not pro prospective randomized trials, which you can't do in, in this, you know, with this situation. But they are huge numbers of patients uh, followed very carefully for 10 years. And both of them show, without any question, that there is a benefit of long term survival. And one of the first that showed that was our group uh, at Northwestern, Rick Lee and Pat McCarthy wrote a paper showing five years survival. If you go through the literature, there are a lot of papers that show there's a survival benefit though, at five years and at 10 years. Uh, but I think, so I think that the next time the guidelines are, are, uh, are presented, that it will probably include um, the fact that the survival is improved. So, so if you had recommendations out there to surgeons, you know, I'm just wondering, what do you think the barriers are to say somebody who's just having bypass grafts who's got atrial fibrillation? Is it the fact that they're needing to open the heart and they don't like that, or they're worried about the mitral isthmus lesion? What do you think the main barriers are out well, there? Well, those are certainly two of them. You know, the, <clears throat> there was an independent survey done at the 2010 uh, AATS meeting, and uh, there were a lot of surgeons participated in it. It wasn't an AATS officially functioned uh, event, but uh, they asked that question, why is it that uh, you ignore the atrial fibrillation in these patients? Because even by then we were realizing benefits uh, uh, could be accrued by, by ablating the atrial fib. The first reason was that they thought it increased the risk of the operation. Well, because it's going to prolong it. Uh, and it's exactly the opposite. It has either no, no effect on morbidity and mortality or it actually improves the mortality, the operative mortality. The second reason was that they weren't sure that there was a consensus of the major organizations as to this being the best thing to do. Obviously, all of the major organizations do that, including the guidelines now. The third was um, that it, uh, they weren't sure of the benefits, uh, that it really mattered. That's obviously been answered now. And the fourth was, uh, most common reason that they didn't do it, is they didn't feel comfortable doing the operation. In other words, they really didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a lot of effort uh, with industry as well as, as the, you know, the program directors and, 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 and thoracic surgeons and so on, over the last decade, just trying to educate the surgeons and teach them exactly how to do this. Because if you don't do it correctly, it won't work. This is like anything else. If you do it correctly, it's not surgeon dependent. And the operation works. And you can do it, obviously, a lot easier than we did 30 years ago. Because, uh, uh, you know, we have cryoprobes and, uh, and uh, uh, radio frequency ablation devices and so on that are really excellent. Uh, a lot of people have made the mistake of equating the term maze three procedure with cut and sew maze three. And those aren't equivalent terms that 
I personally did about 500 or so of the maze procedures, and uh, they're all maze threes. But the last half of those, at least, maybe more, uh, were done strictly with cryo probes. So after 1997, I never did another cut and sew maze procedure. So, Nevad, uh, who was my fellow back then at the, at the end of the 90s, uh, has now done well over a thousand, strictly with just cryo probes. They're maze threes, they're cryo maze threes, the same thing we did 20 years ago. So, so that is a little bit of, a, of a, a nuance that the maze three is a pattern of lesions, like the maze four is a pattern of lesions. Uh, Ralph Damiano described the maze four and electrophysiologically, it's exactly the same as the maze three, but it's done with radio frequency clamps, cryoprobes, and so on, and, and you can do it a lot quicker. Uh, Pat McCarthy, who I work with now, um, well, he works, and I'm there. I don't do much, but, but anyhow, he's developed a way of uh, doing the cryo uh, maze procedure uh, uh, with just three uh, with three applications of the cryoprobe on the left side, three on the right which makes it even quicker. So I think that the progress has been made. Obviously, uh, we started doing minimally invasive uh, through small incision cryo maze procedures in 1997. And um, because everybody was developing minimally invasive procedures for everything. And uh, so uh, some people still prefer the medium stenotomy. It's actually a lot easier to do, I think, through the right chest. Um, and of course, there have been a, a, a number of people uh, who've done uh, robotic mazes and endoscopic mazes and so on and so forth. So, been a lot of progress made over that period of time. Yeah, yeah and, and I guess just, just finally to finish up, where do you see the future? Do you think this should be a best practice outcome instead of publishing people's mortalities, publish their AF cure rates, or where, where do you see the next 10 years of maize procedures? Well, I think, the, I think the biggest problem we're facing uh, is, is uh, applicable both to catheter ablation and surgery, not just specific to surgery. And that is uh, that we have an absolutely worthless, useless classification system for atrial fib. It's not based on anatomy. It's not based on physiology. And if you're doing any kind of intervention, is intervention basically creating scars in the atrium, that's surgery. We can do it surgically, or you can do it with a catheter, but it's still the same idea of the way to treat uh, the problem. And uh, so you're dealing with images or anatomy or phys and physiology and so on. And the classification system of atrial fibrillation is based on one thing. How long, do you, how long do the episodes last? Did they last less than a week, more than a week, but less than a year, or more than a year? It had nothing to do with anatomy or physiology, either one. Because once you go into an episode of atrial fibrillation, you can be in it for one minute and map it. It looks the same as if you've been in it 10 years. So the same physiology involved. So that has nothing to do uh, with quality of life, with, uh, with uh, what size the atrium is, is it thick? Are both atria large? How much scar do you have, like the people from Utah talk about? All those things have got to be important. And, and, and perhaps even more importantly is the way we follow it. Somebody uh, pulled 30 seconds out of midair. Uh, I think it was based on what we used to use for VTAC. If you had a sustained episode of VTAC longer than 30 seconds, then you were a lot more likely to have ventricular fibrillation has nothing to do with atrial fibrillation. So I think that's where it came from. But, uh, but the HRS uh, guidelines uh, say that a failure of, a, of, of catheter ablation or surgery uh, is 30 seconds of documented atrial fibrillation off medication more than three months after, after intervention. Well, again, that has absolutely nothing to do. <clears throat> so, uh, is the patient better? Is the likelihood of stroke decreased? Is the patient's life expectancy increased? All the kinds of things that we, we think are important for coronary disease and valve disease, they're important for, for AFib disease too. And so we need to have a new classification system based on anatomy and physiology 
then we would know what to do in individual patients when they're being uh, undergoing intervention, catheter or surgery, and then we would have a, a, a concrete way of determining the definition of success and failure afterwards. And until we do that, we're not going to make any progress, in my opinion, because we're still going to be looking at looking for 30 seconds or putting loop recorders in and looking for two minutes. I have a slide that uh, I think the patient that uh, Pat McCarthy operated on a few years ago, and uh, he had a loop recorder put in prior to surgery and for several weeks and months before. And on the loop recorder, he had 24 hours of continuous AFib every day for weeks. And it's documented you know, on, the, on the tracing. The data for surgery uh, is, is noted. A couple of days after that, he had some post-op AFib and actually had to be cardioverted. You go through the blanking period, and he had a little blips every now and then. And then after that, the uh, line, you know, the baseline is absolutely clear. It's absolutely clean. There's no AFib at all, except if you look very carefully, you can see one little two minute blip way out here at like six or eight months. That's a failure. <laughs> I mean, you know, and the patient didn't even know he had it. The patient's absolutely happiest guy in the world, but he is a failure. One of the other problems we have that we've got to get away from is uh, most long-term results are reported on the basis of Kaplan-Meier curves. Well, you know, those are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll give you that you can't come back from death. So once you, you know, die, then, you, you know, your number goes down. But if you have two seconds, of it, uh, two minutes of atrial fibrillation, seven months after surgery when you've been in it all the time and you're a failure, you can come back from that. You know, that's not a fatal event. So anything that is a reversible event should not be reported as Captain Meyer because that person, once you go down, can never come back up because it's a survival curve. So I th we, we have to be more intelligent about how we report our results. So I think that the results, the actual clinical results of both catheter ablation and surgical ablation are substantially better than we walk around saying that. Well, it sounds like there's another 20 years of work to do. So I yeah, think you've got a busy future ahead of you. <laughs> now, somebody else is going to have to do that. And well, then a lot of people work and, I, and a lot of people are doing really nice jobs. So. Yeah, well, well, certainly for myself and everyone at CTSNet, you've made the most amazing contribution to cardiac surgery worldwide and uh, an you. incredible figure. And I know everybody's so appreciative of your amazing teaching that you're doing right now and every day. And even at this conference, uh, your, your talks are absolutely phenomenal. So well, thank you so much. Just like say thank you very much. Thank you so much.